Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is a few aspects of my own research. Um, so research that actually stretches back to 2001-2002, right up to what I've been doing more recently. My most recent work in the last six years um, has been quantitative work using a big longitudinal survey of children and young people, um, children and their families rather, which I'll talk about later. But what I'm going to do at the start is, is talk about what brought me to do the study that I've been doing with the Growing Up in Scotland children, what qualitative work that I did in the past and, and how it brought me to where I am now. So my previous work was qualitative and small scale and when I was looking at social connectedness that wasn't the function of the research I was doing at all it was actually coming through almost incidentally it was things that kept emerging as I was speaking to more and more families and it became something that just kind of stuck in my mind over the years about how people's connections with other people um, Im improved things like well-being and mitigated elements of poverty so to say that my qualitative research was unrepresentative is not a, an insult to qualitative research at all. I'm a strong advocate of qualitative research. Rather, it's just, it kind of explains why I went on to then do quantitative research. And that was because when I was working at Bernardo's um, and doing a large study of families living in poverty, which I'll talk about, we were doing um, seminars to the child poverty unit at the Westminster government and we're being told that because we were only um, speaking to a small number of families that our study was unrepresentative and therefore lacked influence. And, and that kind of grated because we had some fantastic data. So that made me want to come on to um, quantitative methods. But first let me take you way back to 2001-2002 when this report was written by a member of our audience there, Emma. And I was Emma's researcher on this report. And what we did was we um, interviewed 53 people who were at risk of being repossessed, whose homes were being repossessed in Scotland. And we did this for the, the then Scottish executive to, to find out what could help people who were in that situation. What could the government do? What could banks do? And the, the project itself was also speaking to banks, speaking to money lenders speaking to debt advice. There was a huge, huge study that, that spoke to lots of people and I was just responsible for speaking to the families. And you don't have to read all that, you can read the red bits. And what kept coming through for me then, and what stuck in my mind then when I was speaking to these 53 people, were those who managed to recover, those who didn't get their homes repossessed, were those that had the, the, the closest connections to family and friends, including family and friends who were willing and able to step in and pay their mortgage um, or, or help cover their, their debts when necessary. So that just stuck in my mind from that period. So I'm going to shoot forward now to 2009 when I'm working as a researcher for Bernardo's Children's Charity. And we did a 12-month qualitative study of families living in poverty. We went to visit them every two months we spoke to parents and we spoke to children and we followed their experiences about what it was like to live in poverty. So some of these are quotes from the children. And what was amazing is how much the children were strongly connected to their families and their extended families and their, the friends of their parents as well as their own peer group and how important they were for lots of aspects of children's well-being was, was this connection and including very much to, to grandparents as Glenda wouldn't be surprised to hear. So in light of these studies I wanted to go from qualitative to quantitative evidence because I wanted to <coughs> I wanted to know whether the qualitative evidence that I felt I had been seeing over these years uh, could be found in a, in a quantitative way, could it be found in big numbers? I wanted to know whether I could see if there was a statistical association between being socially connected and improved well-being. But what I was curious about, because I was, all my qualitative studies had been speaking to parents and their children, it was all about um, mothers and fathers and, and their families, so I, I was curious about whether 
if how connected, socially connected a mother was, whether you could detect that um, improvement to well-being in a child, whether you, could, um, um, whether you could detect that statistically speaking, if you like. Because a lot of my study is to do with poverty, I wanted to know whether this, if there was an impact, if there was an effect, whether it was different across different levels of income, or whether it was equally good for everyone, you know, whether it just shifted everyone up to a higher level of well-being, or whether it was different for, for different people. And I wanted to do it because of uh, that annoying man uh, in the child poverty unit who said that my study was unrepresentative and lacking influence because it didn't have big enough numbers. So having 5,000 children and families in the Growing Up in Scotland study, I decided was big enough numbers. <laughs> so so I'll, I'll very briefly go over the data because... If you're technically minded, you can ask me more about the data later, but otherwise it can be um, really uh, dull for some people. So, what I did was, five years worth of the Growing Up in Scotland study started when a child was 10 months old um, and goes back to the same families every year and talks to the, the main carer and talks about the child. As the children grow older, they will become incorporated into the study in their own right. So these children were aged between 0 and 5 is when I... Um, use the data for them. <coughs> so maternal social assets or social connectedness um, was particular, I narrowed it to family and friends. There are ways of looking at whether they're more socially connected on a community basis, whether they have community assets, but the focus I wanted was to do with an extended family and friendship groups. Income, what I did is just averaged it across the five years and divided it into 20% chunks by 20% chunks so that we can compare across um, the upper and lower income. And some of you will know the strength and difficulties questionnaire that's used with various ages of children, which I'll talk a wee bit more about. And as Marion was explaining, everything I show you is also controlled for other socio-demographic variables such as maternal <coughs> education, ethnicity... Um, number of children in the family and all those types of things. So the stress and difficulties questionnaire has all these types of questions and I've reversed it so that a high score is good and a low score is bad. I've also standardised it so that the, the average for everyone is the average is zero and if you have a positive score it's good and if you have a negative score it's bad so it's quite intuitive. As I say, I've just averaged income and divided it by five. And the reason I did that, because I did two types of analysis. I looked at people just living in poverty and people living in persistent poverty over time. And um, it became quite interesting to me to think that we have lots of research on poverty and we're always doing research on poverty and we never really do research on um, the wealthy or the more wealthy or the people who are at the higher end of the income spectrum. So I thought it'd be interesting to try and do a comparison between the two. So, I hope you liked Marion's graphs, because you've got more coming. <laughs> and these are just, what this is, so this, the five points are the five income quintiles. One, two, three, four, five. That means first 20%, next 20%, and so forth. And this is the social, emotional, and behavioural well-being of the child aged five years up the side. So, what you can see here is that it's quite socially patterned already. Um, children from higher income families um, display higher social, emotional and behavioural well-being. What we have here is maternal social connectedness to family and friends. And again, what you can see is that that's socially patterned. But what may be shown through here, and may not be, because I went to look into this further, is that people in the highest income quintile actually have social connectedness that's pretty off the scale compared to everyone else. So these, the first four, well, you're looking at this direction, the first four goes like this and then the fifth is actually like this and that is very statistically significant that they have a um, huge social capital, social connectedness compared to, to everyone else on the income spectrum. So what did um, this particular piece of research show. So there's your mean at zero. This is the mean of child well-being, the average. 
Anything below the mean, a negative number is lower than average well-being, and anything above the mean is higher than average well-being. And all I've done here is taken the lowest 20% of income and the highest 20% of income and compared them. And along the bottom of the graph, we have the social connectedness of the mother. So it's the well-being of the child on the y-axis. It's the social connectedness of the mother on the x-axis. And what this is showing is that the green line, which is the bottom line, the steep line, is the lowest income quintile. And you can see that when people are, if you take that to the bottom left, when people have low social connectedness and low income, their children have really low social, emotional, behavioral well-being. If you take that green line and follow it to the top, these are still the same people, still the same level of income. They're still on very low income. But what you find is that when their mothers have high social connectedness, their well-being is crossing that mean line. They're getting it, they're reaching above the mean. Okay. And you can see it also has an improving effect for those on the highest incomes too. Mothers who are socially well connected on the highest income um, also have children with much higher social, emotional, behavioural well-being. I don't know whether you can tell from this graph, but um, those lines are not parallel. So there is a difference in the strength of the effect between those two groups. And further statistical analysis, which you'll be pleased to know I haven't shown you in any slides, actually shows that that, um, that is a significant difference, which I'll go on to explain. So what it showed me, that an interaction effect, showed me that for people <coughs> living in the lowest income quintile, social connectedness does increase their children's social, emotional, behavioural well-being more than everyone else's children along the income spectrum. It does have um, a larger, stronger effect. So this one, I promise I don't have many slides, I have many graphs. This one is um, only people on the lowest income quintile. So we're now looking only at people on the lowest 20% of income. But what the two lines are showing is high social connectedness and low social connectedness. So the blue line, which goes from bad to worse, basically, are, are people who have um, on the lowest income and who are low social connectedness. That is their child's well-being. The other line is people who are equally poor but are, are well socially connected. They have high social connectedness. And as before, that line's crossing the average of all children. Their, their children's social, emotional, behavioural well-being is lifted right up above the mean of all children. That's the end of the graphs. So what it showed is that social connectedness of a mother was highly significantly associated with child social, emotional and behavioural well-being. And for those who like to know such things, it was accounted for about 20% of a standard deviation increase in child well-being for all children in the study, across all income. But for those on persistently low income, across the five years, remember this is averaged across all five years, for those on this income quintile one, there's an increase of 40% of a standard deviation. So the, the effect is double than what it is for all other children. Oh, so why is this the case? If we have practitioners in the room, they'll be thinking, well, it's bloody obvious, isn't it? So some possible routes, because that's one thing the study can't tell me. The data can't tell me that. I can't work out why that might be the case. There's common sense ideas why it might be the case. Some possible routes could be that these, the social, because remember I'm talking about poverty as well, that these social connectedness ease financial strain of families and that can, that can have an indirect effect on the child through maternal well-being. And it can have a direct effect on the child if they're being bought things. And that, would actually, that is actually supported by a lot of my qualitative um, research, which that Harris report is the Bernardo's one. Because what that shows is that children are getting nice training shoes and a decent pair of jeans from their granny and their granddad. Yeah, so it's shown that there's a direct effect for children of the social connectedness of family and friends, as well as the ease and off the strain on the mother. Um, it could be a, 
a mental health impact on the mother. It could be that she's able to be less stressed, less depressed um, with social connectedness and that's having an effect on the child. Because what I haven't said is what struck me about this, because I didn't quite expect to find it, is these children are only five years old. In my qualitative studies, I have spoken to children aged over eight, up to 18. And when I've seen these differences qualitatively in older children, you think, well, older children understand family finances. Older children understand what they have and what they have not in relation to their peer groups. Uh, older children have a very nuanced um, knowledge and skills regarding their family's financial situations and some fantastic strategies for coping with it. But these children are five years old. So how... How is this happening? How, how are we seeing this effect? So these are some of the um, these are some of my thoughts on the issue, and it's possible too that the effect is direct because children are more socially connected to these people and maybe um, get their attention and taken out for day trips or or whatever, and it could have a direct or indirect effect on parenting. So there, and that you may have other ideas yourself about how this is having such a positive. Um, effect. Because I'm into poverty, the child poverty strategy for Scotland that was just published in March, I believe, its nickname is Pockets, Prospects and Places, and because they have, a they have an assets-based approach, and they've been focusing a lot on community assets, to the detriment I feel, well, not to the detriment of, but, and ignoring family assets. So I'm hoping... I've been to speak to the, um, some of the policy people in the Scottish Government. I'm hoping that family assets and, and uh, personal assets or social connectedness rather than just community-based social connectedness gets through to them. And um, because one of the major things in the poverty policy is improving children's well-being and life chances. And as, as Marion said, if you can improve children's um, well-being and chances at this early age and stage, then you, they've got much better chance in adolescence to, to do the work that they're doing and to, to mitigate some of these effects. And with the, I wanted to say as well, um, in regard to Cam's work, what I haven't looked at here, or haven't, not today, is that the qualitative research, another aspect of what was really enabling some, some families to do well and to come off benefits and to get into employment and to get into education, was actually the experience and confidence they had received from doing some voluntary work. So it wasn't social enterprise as such, but it was volunteering, which would be a similar type of field, and it was absolutely crucial as well. So thank you very much. <laughs>